Okay, well, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, this is the first time I've ever done PowerPoint, so I like, just learned it for this talk in particular. Um, and um, um, so what I'm going to say is going to be sort of random, and it's really not even about what I'm doing in my work. It's just sort of the kinds of things that interested me about ancient animals at the moment. Um, okay, so um, the, the ancient stories uh, about animals that we're probably most familiar with are animal fables, and we think of them as sort of Disney-like, right, Aesop's fables are associated with children and Disney. Um, if you think about this particular fable, right, the tortoise and the hare, it really doesn't tell us much about animals at all. This is more about humans, the slow and steady person wins the race. Um, really, a tortoise and a hare in real life would probably not engage in race against each other. Um, but this does seem to be part of uh, an important part of the Greek heritage. This is a Greek postage stamp with Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare. Um, and Aesop himself, you know, was actually a real person, perhaps, or he was as real as Homer, which may not be very real, um, <laughs> lived, lived in the um, late 6th, early 5th century BC. And there were stories about Aesop that he was very grotesque looking. You can see here on this red figure vase, um, right from back then, that um, he's depicted as having this sort of tiny body and this huge head. And he's talking here to a dog, or the dog seems to be talking to him. So he's, um, there are many stories and legends about him from back then in which he talks to animals, the animals all speak the same language back in this sort of golden Aesopic age. Um, and notice also the, another interesting <coughs> thing that what he's holding, oh, this actually functions as a, okay. This is a, some kind of blacksmith's anvil. <clears throat> and Aesop was connected with the working man and with humble people. And so he and the dog seem to be sitting on anvils. And so they're, they're connected with, right, sort of low uh, levels of society, working people, so forth. Um, <clears throat> but in case you think that Aesop was only connected with children's fables and with um, sort of what I consider kind of sickeningly sweet sort of moralistic <laughs> tale, like the uh, tortoise and the hare, um, I'm interested also, now I can't remember whether I have another, um, whoops, oh wait. Um, oops, wait, okay. Okay, so um, let me tell you another fable <coughs> connected with Aesop, one of my favorite ones, the horse and the ass. Um, so a horse and an aged donkey are being led by their master. The horse, which represents the aristocratic person, um, is carrying a heavy load. I mean, sorry, the horse, sorry, the horse is free of burdens and the donkey is carrying a heavy load. The donkey repeatedly asks the horse to carry part of his load, but the horse refuses. The ass plods on, but finally it falls down dead. Okay, and this was the, okay. Um, and it falls down dead, kind of weighed down by this pack, heavy pack that it had to carry. Um, and then at that point, the master takes the load off the ass and loads it onto the horse and also flays the ass and makes the horse carry the ass's flayed skin as well. Um, so <laughs> it's not a very pleasant tale, right? It's not like those <laughs> nice little tortoise and the hare. Um, but it's also interesting that um, right, this is a fable about the class struggle in certain ways. Um, and uh, Phaedrus, um, who was uh, who lived uh, was a, a Latin poet who transformed a lot of um, Aesop's fables into Latin verse, wrote this about uh, the fable. Right, the slave. So he sees the fable as a kind of slave literature. So the slave, being liable to punishment for any offense, since he did not dare to speak what he wanted to say, transferred his own feelings into fables and eluded censure under the guise of jesting with made-up stories. So the horse and the ass in this version represent, right, the ass is a slave, basically, and the horse is the master, right, or the horse is the aristocracy, and the slave is the working man. And it's a coded way of talking about um, class hierarchies. So a lot of Aesop 
is, is like that. Okay, I just want to sort of salvage him. And if, depending on the time, I have another fable to tell you. Um, but I think I want to sort of skip on to the more complicated things. So, um, so here, right, animals are just used as stand-ins for humans. But a much more complicated picture arises when you actually start to think about the differences between humans and animals and look at um, the philosophical statements about the issues. So, um, oh wait, oops, I forgot this, right? This is the thing about PowerPoint. Okay, I'm just kind of fascinated by this, uh, this mosaic here. And um, I have to get farther away to be able to look at it. But um, this is a mosaic from uh, to what's now Tunisia, uh, where right, the Romans um, had conquered Tunisia. And you can see there that there's this owl in the middle. Um, and he's wearing a toga. And, um, and there are all these dead or sick birds around him. <coughs> and what it says here is up at the top in Latin, it says that um, the, the birds are bursting apart with envy, but the owl doesn't care. <laughs> and, um, and you can see this sort of you know, well-fed, fat, aristocratic owl there in the middle. And I would like to read this um, mosaic as being about the class struggle. I'd like to see it sort of more as a Marxist uh, statement here. But I suspect that what might be going on is there, there are, people have said that right, these little symbols over here seem to be uh, symbols of you know, some kind of clubs. So uh, this was originally displayed in a bath. <clears throat> and this may be some sporting club saying, you know, we're gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna kill you guys on the other team, right? <clears throat> we're the owls, and you guys are just the dead birds, right? So it's sort of, it's it's kind of hard to read what some of these mosaics are doing. So I'm just throwing out that out there as a totally irrelevant extra thing. <laughs> um, so anyway, but getting down to the philosophy part. Okay, so Aristotle <clears throat> famously denied reason to animals. And <clears throat> um, here, right, he's, he says, um, animals live, for the most part, by nature, but to some degree by their habits as well. And man, that is humans, live by reason, for he alone of animals possesses reason. Um, and in the history of animals, he takes, we've been looking at this in our core class, but in the history of animals, he takes a slightly different tack um, because he can't deny that there are many similarities between humans and animals. Once you start actually looking at the bodies and the physical uh, states of humans and animals. Um, so here he says some animals are cunning and evil disposed. This is kind of indicates a certain kind of rationality, um, such as the fox, and some are jealous. Some are fond of ornament as the peacock. I kind of like this idea that the peacock is actually putting on some jewelry here. Um, but man is the only animal capable of reasoning, though many others possess the faculty of memory and instruction in common with him. So he relents a little bit here, and he allows animals to have some of the kinds of capabilities that humans possess. Um, and so then, skipping ahead several hundred years, um, and looking at, at Stoic philosophy, um, of which Seneca is a representative. So the Roman Seneca in the first century AD here says, the dumb animal grasps what is present by its senses. It is reminded of the past when it encounters something that alerts its senses. Um, thus, the horse is reminded of the road when it's brought to where it starts but in its stable it has no memory of it, however often it has been trodden. As for the future, that does not concern dumb animals. So, so right, the horse can be sort of trotting along and at the crossroads, it says, oh yeah, I remember this is the way to the village. But when it's sitting there in the stable, it doesn't think about the past or the future, right? And these are some of the things we're talking about in core two, you know, right? How do we know whether animals know the future or not, right? These are questions that are still being debated now. Um, but, um, okay, whoops, sorry, oh, whoops. Um, but, but Plutarch, um, in the late first century, uh, early second century AD, um, was on the other side of the fence, and uh, Plutarch wrote a number of treatises that talk about uh, the fact that he believes that animals actually 
are sentient and do possess reason and do possess emotion. So he has this one treatise on the cleverness of animals. He says, all animals partake in one way or another of reason, uh, right, these are the Greek words here, logismos, and understanding or thought, dianoia. Um, okay, and in this debate, actually, he, he talks about whether land animals or sea animals are more <laughs> clever, and um, there are various characters who debate these two. Um, okay, and then um, also here he says, right, mere, uh, so again, these are characters in the dialogue, mere reason. <clears throat> um, okay, so sorry. Um, he also argues that while humans have to learn some of these things, right, reason and speech and so forth, animals actually are superior because they possess these abilities by nature. So he says mere reason is implanted by nature, but real and perfect reason is the product of care and education. And this is why every li living creature has the faculty of reasoning, but if they seek true reason and wisdom, not even man may be said to possess it. Okay, so, so lots of us, right? So we have the ability to achieve reason, and yet what do we do with it, right? We most of the time sit around being couch potatoes or whatever the ancient equivalent is of this. Okay, and this is, this is Plutarch. Um, but in another work, which we also read in our core two class, um, this work is spoken by a pig named Gryllus. And this pig was, um, used to be a human. But um, you remember in the Odyssey that Circe transforms um, all the men who come to her island into, into swine, right, into pigs. And um, Odysseus arrives at the island and he says, well, Circe, you have to transform all these guys back into humans. But he talks to this pig, Gryllus, and Gryllus says, you know, I'd really rather remain a pig. It's much better remain being a pig. Um, and so, uh, so he, he goes on into a long speech about how superior animals are to humans, right? And so he says, for if you speak the truth and say that nature is their teacher, that is animals' teacher, you're elevating the intelligence of animals to the most sovereign and wisest of principles. So that then intelligence that doesn't have to be taught is actually a superior kind of intelligence. So the fact that animals have instincts doesn't make them inferior, as we would say today, or many of us would say today, but rather um, the fact that they have instincts makes them, right, makes, makes them actually superior and sort of divine. So that there are all these kinds of boundaries. So instead of humans being closer to the divine, animals now are, are closer to the divine than humans. Um, okay, where am I going next here? Okay, okay, so this, um, so the real point of doing this talk, is, as Chris pointed out in his introduction, is um, I work on Apuleius. I do almost all of my work on Apuleius. Um, this is a picture of him from um, a ceiling that was pieced back together um, in Trier. And this is thought, it's thought to be, to have represented scenes from his works, not just the golden ass or metamorphoses for which he's most famous, but other scenes as well. And who knows if this looks anything like him, but this is the one image that we have that might be a picture of Apuleius. So it's very exciting to classes so who don't have access to this kind of thing. Um, and, um, and so just basically Apuleius, um, has written uh, this novel, which is sort of our size novel, um, about a man who <coughs> travels around, he's interested in magic, he ends up in Thessaly in Greece, which is where it's most famous for witches. If you want to find witches, you go to Thessaly in Greece, and every woman there is a witch. And so he, he's interested in transforming into a bird, but by mistake, um, he turns into a donkey. And um, when he's a, and Everyone who studies Apuleius is sort of obsessed with donkeys, so I just tried to collect as many pictures of donkeys here as I could. <laughs> um, and the middle one, actually, is another one. Most of the mosaics you'll see are Tunisian Roman mosaics um, from 2nd to 3rd century AD. Uh, so we have a donkey, ancient donkey there. Um, but when Lucius is transformed into a donkey, as I have up there, sort of awkwardly, he says, although I had become an ass and a beast of burden instead of Lucius, um, I retained my human intelligence, my sensum humanum, 
Um, so throughout the two thirds of this novel, we have this donkey traveling around um, with the mind of a human, but the body of a donkey. And so, um, as with many other things in Apuleius, right, this sort of a hybrid identity is created here. And it becomes an occasion for a kind of thought experiments on what it would like be, what it would be like to be an animal. Except that, as this, our students in Core 2 keep pointing out, right, it's not really, he's not really an animal, he's really a human, but there's some kind of hybridity going on here that's kind of interesting. Um, so um, I picked right this sort of this sort of long passage here to think about um, that here Lucius has recently been turned into a donkey, and he's traveling around the, on the road with another donkey and a horse. Um, so there are three of them there. There's the horse and the two donkeys, and so there's this sort of doppelganger donkey there. Um, and so Lucius uh, is carrying this very very heavy load, right? So he says. The robbers took us out of the stable and gave me especially a much heavier load. You can sort of see here, I bet it wasn't any heavier than the other donkey's load, but anyway. Um, when we had completed a good part of the day's march and I was fatigued from the length of the route, depressed by the weight of my load, wearied by the blows of the clubs, and lamely staggering on worn out hoofs. This guy has been a kind of um, over pampered aristocrat, you know, before this. Um, and so I halted beside a creek with quietly winding water. I happily seized on this fine opportunity and formed a plan. Okay, so Kogetabon, so he's, he's, he's a donkey, but he's forming a plan. I would skillfully bend my knees and throw myself flat to the ground, bound and determined not to get up and walk for all the beatings in the world. Yes, prepared to lie there, even if they dug into me, not just with a club, but with a sword. I assumed that, since I was now totally exhausted and feeble, the robbers would leave me behind for, as prey for wolves and vultures. Right, so you can sort of see how he's thinking through as if this really involves um, serious, right, reasoning capacities of the human. You know, what can he do to save himself, right? But this fine plan of mine, concilium is the word, um, was foiled by a wretched piece of luck. The other ass guessed and anticipated my scheme. Um, at once he pretended exhaustion and threw himself down with his baggage. He lay there like a corpse, and despite sticks and goads, and despite their efforts to pull him up by his tail and ears and legs from every side, he made no attempt to rise. So the, this is the bad part. The robbers hamstrung all his legs and hurled him, still breathing, over a deep precipice. So at that point, considering the, the fortune of my poor comrade in arms, I decided to abandon all schemes and tricks and show my master that I could be a model ass. Um, okay, and then, so I went actually, and so then he says, we shortly arrived at our destination once there after I was freed of my burdens. Instead of a bath, I dissipated my weariness by rolling in the dust. So this idea that somehow, I'd see there's this kind of, hybrid thing, right? He's thinking of this as a bath, and yet somehow his donkey body makes him roll in the dust. So I think there are sort of profound things going on here in a sense about the mind-body question. And just sort of going back um, here, I'm trying to represent, um, right, so if we have maybe that's Lucius over there, and this is the other donkey over here. Um, that um, late Lucius claims to retain his human sensibilities, and he's proud of it. He's always saying, let me show you, let me describe this, this cliff here so you just know that I'm still pretty smart. Um, but he says, uh, but, but because of the demands of his donkey body, he often thinks like a donkey while imagining that he's thinking like a human. So, um, so in that passage, the thoughts of Lucius are juxtaposed with the actions of the real donkey here. Um, uh, and what, so, so the question is, you know, is Apuleius up to anything aside from just sort of the humor of this? Um, his character Lucius attributes reasoning to the other donkey as well, and he also calls his own donkey thinking cogitatus, which is a serious word for thinking and reasoning in Latin. Um, at the end of the scene, he's shown rolling in the dirt instead of a bath, apparently unaware for the moment that he's engaging in donkey behavior. So, so the question I, I have here is, right, does Apuleius suggest that what we think of as, as instinctual behavior in animals is really reason, 
or is he commenting on the mind-body problem? Even if we, if we retain human sensibilities, we may be prompted by our donkey bodies to behave like animals. Um, so in either case, so you know, is this funny, or is, this, or is it really seriously calling into question the nature of you know, animal thinking? Um, in either case, it does seem to me to challenge the Aristotelian and Stoic designation of reason as entirely human. Um, and the other thing that I think is interesting about this passage is that um, right, it's, it calls attention to the abuse of animals. So um, I have to confess that I'm a longtime vegetarian, so I hope I don't <laughs> say anything too offensive here. But um, there's, um, throughout this whole uh, novel, when Lucius is a donkey, we hear about the world from the animal perspective. So even if it isn't entirely uh, an animal perspective, that is, you know, we have no way of knowing how animals really think. But we can imagine that if you were an animal and you're carrying very heavy loads and you're being beaten by your masters who uh, want you to go faster up the cl steep cliffs, right, that it's not, it's not going to be a happy thing. And um, that there's an article that um, I really like by someone named Elizabeth Hazelton Haight uh, in 1943 where she argues that Apuleius is sort of like some um, ASPCA tract about the cruelty of animals, right? That you could take a lot of these passages out of Apuleius and just put them into some little brochure about cruelty to animals. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting that, um, right, this, this isn't something you actually see elsewhere in Latin literature. It's really something that comes from this animal perspective. And um, I sort of, this thing got, I, I have to skip ahead. In the, Sorry, don't look at any of those words. Uh, okay, so, so another place where this comes up is that um, at a certain point late on in the book, um, Lucius is condemned, uh, actually, um, Lucius is supposed to mate with a human woman who has been, been condemned to be torn apart by beasts in the Roman amph amphitheater, right? And so, you know, if you watch late night movies, right, this is what the Romans did all day, every day, right? Was put people in the amphitheater and have them torn apart by beasts. So Lucius is, um, right, he's, he's worried because he's, you know, here he is with his human sensibilities, and he's got to go out and have sex with this woman in front of this whole crowd. And he's a little bit ashamed of this in the first place because being a woman, he thinks this is a private matter. But he also says, for I thought that um, there we should be locked together in a loving embrace, and whatever animal was let loose to devour the woman, and, and this woman, I have to say, richly deserves to be torn about, apart by these guys. She, uh, she's a multiple murderess, and including she murdered, poisoned her own daughter, but she killed many people. Um, and um, uh, so, she, okay, so whatever animals let loose to devour the woman was hardly likely to be so discriminating or well-trained or so firmly in control of its appetites as to tear to pieces the woman at my side and spare me as the uncondemned and innocent party. Um, this is, I didn't put the reference, but this is Apuleius in uh, Book 10, Chapter 34. Um, and this is, again, another one of these Tunisian mosaics here with this lion. I, I, that might be a donkey there that it's tearing apart. I'm not really sure. But again, you sort of see... Um, on the one hand, very obviously, you see the perspective of the victims in the amphitheater. And this is not something you see very often in the ancient world. Um, so the an not just the animal victims, but we also imagine that there are a lot of, you know, the proverbial Christians who are being torn apart in the amphitheater, but also the condemned criminals and so forth. And really, um, sometimes we hear, uh, say, Seneca talks about the damage that it does to the viewer to watch animals being you know, animals tearing apart humans in the amphitheater, because it makes us um, less sensitive to the suffering of others and things like that. But you don't really hear in Roman literature about the perspective of the victims and especially the animal victims. So again, um, I think one of the things that Apuleius does, even if we don't grant him uh, full understanding of the animal brain, is that he brings attention to the animal plight, the plight of animals. Okay, so going back here, so again, don't look at these. Okay, okay, whoops, here we are. Okay, so one of the things um, that I want to focus on for a moment here is the idea that, um, right, uh, 
um, Seneca and Aristotle and others denied that animals had emotions. Okay, so this was again then as now. There's a big debate about whether animals feel emotions in the same way that we do. So it's a sort of subset of cognitive abilities. Um, so Seneca here says, um, mute animals lack human emotions, but they have certain impulses, we could sort of say instincts, similar to them. Um, and Seneca and others so always believe that you have to have, you have to understand a situation in a way that animals can't in order to be able to have true emotions about it. Um, but an impulse like fear might be a kind of instinctive impulse, but it's not an emotion in the same kind of way that a human might understand the situation to have an emotion. But um, this is where I think that ancient literature often, uh, as, I mean, Apuleius, but also Ovid, give us a different kind of window into the, the possibility that animals have emotions um, so, uh, okay, now I have something written here that, um, I'll just read what I wrote here. So, uh, Ovid and Apuleius both experiment with granting their metamorphosed animals some intense feelings of grief and frustration. And I didn't back up and say who Ovid is. So, Ovid wrote a, a different metamorphoses, which probably most of you know about, right? Ovid's metamorphoses in which many humans turn into animals, right? And humans turn into other things, rocks and trees and uh, stars and other things as well. But there are many animal metamorphoses in Ovid. So again, as in Apuleius, <coughs> you have the chance to experiment with animal subjectivity. So here's a human that is turning into an animal. It thinks partly like an animal and it thinks partly like a human, but it gives us some sort of sense of animal perspective. And this first quotation I have from Ovid here, um, comes, uh, is, is addressing the character of Io. And Io is what had been a beautiful young woman who, uh, unfortunately, Jupiter cast his eye on her and uh, pursued her and um, had sex with her. And then Juno came along and he said, oops, you know, I better hide this woman because Juno's gonna be angry as she always is. And so he turns her into a cow. So Io has now been turned into a cow, and she wanders around the Mediterranean um, as a cow for a long time. And then she decides she's going to pray to Jupiter. So she, so she sank uh, to her knees, right, in a sort of prayer gesture, uh, by the bank of the river, looked up with her neck thrown back, and lacking the arms to lift up in prayer, so this is a kind of ancient prayer where people lifted their arms up, she uplifted her face to the stars. The groans that she uttered, the tears that she shed, and her piteous lowings seemed to be challenging Jupiter, pleading with him to grant an end to her sufferings. So, so you get this sort of sense that um, Io, um, right, she's deprived of human arms. She's deprived, you know, it's hard for her to look up. She doesn't have speech. But there is a sense that, in some sense, through her gestures, um, she is communicating, and you know, this is something that people who are studying animal communication talk a lot about now, right? That animals may not speak in words, but you know, things like uh, piteous lowings and um, gestures that animals make, right? These are actually expressive and, um, right, can be scientifically proven to be actually expressive. So, um, so I think that, right, Ovid is up to again, kind of breaking down this absolute boundary between humans and animals, showing that animals um, have a way of, of communicating and thinking. And then the Apuleius passage here um, is from the moment when Lucius finally, after spending most of the book as a donkey, um, he uh, comes to the seashore and he sees the moon rising, and in the moon he imagines a uh, beneficent goddess, um, and he gets down and prays to the moon by the seashore. And he says, happy and eager, I began to pray to the mighty goddess with a tear-drenched face. So he imagined this donkey crying, right? Um, and, <clears throat> and actually, again, sort of trying to, trying to reach up to this goddess that is the moon and the sky. 
And so we have um, actually not, you know, not just his gestures, but this kind of sense of religious feeling coming from an animal. Um, again, it's a human animal, okay? But I still think of these as sort of thought experiments um, on the part of Ovid and Apuleius. Um, it's also interesting that the um, tears and happiness that are joined together. So this animal, <coughs> human animal, has very complex emotions here. Um, and then, so plenty. So I thought I'd put this. You know, this is our. Uh, favorite horse from, whoops, uh, it's not working. Anyway, um, from Humanities 203, right? This is, uh, uh, we live with this horse constantly day in day out, um, otherwise known as the horse, you know, from the Parthenon pediments. But um, uh, Pliny the Elder um, writes uh, as a sort of naturalist, I and mean, Pliny the Elder wrote a compendium of, of all sorts of things, including many stories about animals. Um, especially interesting are his stories about elephants. But um, horses, right here, he's talking about all sorts of different horses. Um, and here he says, the Sybarite horses um, also know beforehand, right, they're, they're prophetic horses, know beforehand when there's going to be a battle. <clears throat> and when they lose their masters, they mourn for them. Sometimes they shed tears at the bereavement. So. Here, Pliny the Elder <coughs> is actually um, arguing that, you know, these are real horses that are shedding real tears. Um, <coughs> Pliny, sorry. <coughs> um, sorry. <coughs> okay, just eat a few bites of something. <coughs> <coughs> um, so, um, these horses, these same horses that mourn for their masters, he says, um, they sometimes dance a kind of ballet. So here we have a kind of animal art. And um, others, <clears throat> when their masters are killed in battle, they commit suicide by jumping off a precipice, right, with the, their new masters who have, you know, jumped on their backs. That's so they just run, jump off a precipice. And um, they're fired with indignation at you know being owned by someone who killed their master. Right, so he has all sorts of descriptions of animal emotions. Um, and <clears throat> um, Pliny also talks a lot about these elephants. And there were a lot of elephants around Rome um, that right had because Rome had conquered uh, parts of Africa. They had brought elephants over. They were intrigued by elephants. Um, I mean, this is one of these Tunisian elephants, but um, I have here, this is also, this is a Roman mosaic from Ostia, um, so in Rome, that's of this elephant. It's a little exaggerated, that trunk is a little long, but, but going back to Pliny, I mean, sorry, uh, Pliny is talking about, at a certain point, Pompey, um, on, under the Republic, right, um, decided that when he had, he had um, triumphed in battle, he decided to bring elephants to Rome and to exhibit elephants in the amphitheater. And he thought this would be a great show for the Romans. They would all love him because he's putting on this great show with all these elephants. And they had hunters hunting the elephants within the amphitheater. But, um, but at this point, one of the, the mother elephants actually becomes very um, distraught because her children are being killed by the hunters. And she gets down on her knees, right? And so then he says, Pompey's elephants, when they had lost all hope of escape, tried to gain the compassion of the crowd by indescribable gestures of entreaty, deploring their fate with a sort of wailing. Okay, so these sort of elephants are, are wailing and, you know, right, sort of making some kind of gestures. Um, and in fact, they win over the crowd. So this crowd that sort of inured to all this bloodshed in the arena um, actually plead with uh, the hunters not to kill the elephants and the elephants are saved, and then Pompey becomes very unpopular after this. <laughs> um, so, um, and Pliny also, so we can look at this other elephant for a while, um, Pliny also um, asserts that elephants engage in religious rituals of sorts, um, and that they are very private about their mating. And he also has one elephant that he says wrote, knew how to write in Greek. Um, so obviously, I mean, people talk about Pliny, <clears throat> Pliny and his animals. I mean, Pliny just sort of included anything he ever heard in his compendium of knowledge. 
So he wasn't very discriminating mm -hmm. about it. But obviously there are all these stories out there in the ancient world that he's collecting about the emotions and gestures of animals. Um, also we read in Core, now I can't remember the name of that author, but um, uh, there's a sort of, uh, this is not my own idea, what, what was the name of the author who wrote about Pliny's elephants? I don't know. Okay, 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 that makes two of us, okay. But anyway, there's a sort of, um, the way he describes elephant society is, is almost anthropological, right? He sort of studies their religion and he studies their social gatherings, he studies their language. And so um, Pliny manages to treat the elephant society as almost like a human society, which sort of seems very close to what, you know, Primatologists, right, are sort of doing now. Let's go out and you know study the whole uh, social structure of animals and believe that animals have some kind of social structure as well. Um, and um, um, yeah, and and I mean, um, elephants in particular have drawn interest of in more modern times as um, actually being capable of tears. So Darwin in his book about the emotions of animals um, looks at some uh, Indian elephants who were known to have um, wept tears. This seems to be a familiar phenomenon. Some people think it's just sort of some discharge of the eye, but there have been studies that have shown that the, that the elephants actually do seem to cry when they're suffering. Um, so it seems like Pliny is, is kind of hitting on something um, that you know, people are, are now looking at. Uh, again, um, okay, that was that one. Um, okay, so then um, um, I just sort of, as I said I was going to talk about Ovid and I didn't do much with Ovid. This is a little bit un disconnected, but one of the things I'm, I'm interested in is just, you know, this whole, the whole way that much ancient literature as opposed to ancient philosophy is interested in breaking down these absolute boundaries between humans and animals, and Ovid uh, does this over and over again by uh, showing us humans who turn into animals. So this is just one of my favorite metamorphoses here, a lesser known one, and this is a, a woman named Okiroe, who uh, for no reason at all, she sort of, maybe she prophesies a little too much, and she you know, tells the future the gods maybe are a little upset. It's really rather unexplained why she turns into what she turns into, but here she's speaking. Now it appears that my human form is creeping away from me. Grass, sorry, grass is the food that I long for. So this is a kind of animal subjectivity. I feel an impulse to gallop across wide plains. I am turning into a mare, akin to my father. Her father was Chiron, who was half horse and half human. Um, so I'm turning into a mare, akin to my father, but why completely? My father is still half human. This seems really bizarre to me. Like, why can't I turn into only half a horse instead of this? Um, while she was speaking, the final part of her plaintive lament could hardly be understood as her words had become confused. Soon they were not even words, nor yet the sounds of a horse, but more of a person aping those sounds. In the briefest of moments, she clearly whinnied and dropped her arms to the ground as four legs, her fingers then collapsed and her five nails formed an unbroken line in the shape of a light horn hoof. Her mouth was extended and so was her neck. The greater part of her long cloak turned to a tail and the red gold hair which had loosely covered her shoulders was changed to a mane on the right of her neck. Her voice and her body were altered alike and the miracle gave her a new name, Hippe, and Hippe is horse in Greek. So, um, I mean, I feel like this shows, you know, as in Ovid again and again, sort of this continuity between human and animal, that, you know, we have these hands, but they could coalesce into hoofs, and there's sort of, there is available out there this idea of the transformation or of the continuity between human and animal. And I have these, um, this over here, oh yeah, okay, it does work. That's her father, Chiron, right, on a, uh, black figure, Greek vase, um, obviously half horse, half human, and I don't even know what to, I downloaded it was from the internet, but um, here's Okiroe, right, sort of ha turning into a horse here, sort of waving goodbye to us, um, and, uh, right, and then there's, there's her father, right, um, half horse, half human, 
um, holding this baby. I think the baby is Asclepius, but Chiron was the teacher of actually many young heroes, including Achilles. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's sort of this fluidity is kind of the thing that I'm interested in that you see, especially in literature, where in philosophy it's not as possible to convey the kind of fluidity between humans and animals that we see here. And so then I had this rapidly uh, written um, conclusion here, which I hope is not too militantly animal rights or something. So, um, so just uh, so the boundaries. Um, I, I know. I think I was going to say originally was going to say more about the connection to contemporary debates about humans and animals, but maybe you can sort of extrapolate. But the boundaries that humans draw between themselves and animals depicting animals as incapable of reason, emotion, communication, religious feeling, the creation of art, and much more, obviously allow us to exploit animals in ways that would otherwise be impossible. In antiquity, that exploitation took somewhat different forms. Consumption of animals, abuse of them during work and transportation, the public killing of exotic animals in the arena, such as we just looked at, battles between lions and elephants and gladiators and that sort of thing, where now, instead of some of these practices, we have inhumane factory farming, animal experimentation, and the destruction of viable animal habitats. Um, right now, cognitive scientists, philosophers, artists, animal rights activists, environmentalists, and foodies are rethinking the boundaries we took for granted a few decades ago and touching on the same issues expressed more obliquely in much ancient literature.